how do I or you keep the new covenant? What is the new covenant? Who is the new covenant? How do I keep the new covenant? Well, it's a trick question because I don't keep the new covenant and you don't keep the new covenant. The new covenant is something we enter by faith. So there's an old covenant and a new covenant. We know that. The old covenant demanded that you keep the law, which no one could ever do. The law demanded perfection, which no one could ever do. Less one. Less Jesus. He was the only one who could. Moses says in Deuteronomy 29.4 to Israel, he says, You can't follow Yahweh. You don't have eyes to see, ears to hear, or a heart to follow. Israel needed a new heart. Israel needed to be able to see and hear. We would have needed the same thing. So Jesus comes. Jesus comes and actually is the new covenant. Father God makes a covenant with the Son of God because he's the only one he can make it with. Uh, Isaiah 42, verse 5 Thus says God, the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, and who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am Yahweh, he says. I have called you, he's talking to his servant, he's talking to Jesus. I am Yahweh, I have called you in righteousness. I will take you, Jesus, by the hand and keep you. We see that same theme in songs, in Psalms, rather. I will give you as a covenant for my people. He calls him the covenant. Jesus is the covenant. Says the same thing in Isaiah 49. He starts off, he says, Listen, uh, the Lord called me, Isaiah 49, 1b. The Lord called me, someone speaking here. It's not Isaiah, it's not Yahweh, it's none other, uh, other than the servant, it's Jesus. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. Jesus is the word of God. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. Psalm 23. He made me like a polished arrow. and his quiver, he hid me away. He said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Jesus is the Israel of God. By the way, that's why all those comparisons between Israel and Jesus. Israel is slated for slaughter in Egypt by Pharaoh. Jesus is slated for slaughter by Herod. Both are delivered by God. Israel gets led out of Egypt. Jesus is taken out of Egypt. Israel is baptized through the Red Sea. Jesus is baptized by his cousin John. Israel goes into the desert for 40 years and fails miserably. Jesus goes into the desert 40 days and passes perfectly. Jesus, all of those things, Israel has 12 tribes, Jesus has 12 apostles, all of those things are showing it's all pointing to the new covenant, it's all pointing to the Israel of God, it's all pointing to Jesus. He goes on in Isaiah 42 verse 8 and he says, In a time of Favor, I have answered you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. Yahweh talking to Jesus. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land. Jesus is the covenant. Yahweh makes a covenant with the only one he can. There was nothing wrong with the law. There was nothing wrong with the old covenant. The thing that was wrong with it was the recipients. Right? They couldn't keep the covenant. They couldn't keep the law. Neither could we. So Jesus comes and keeps it perfectly. So much does he do everything perfectly that he actually fulfills it. Jesus is the king that's prophesied in Deuteronomy 17. The one who will keep the copy of the law and do it. That's Jesus. Jesus is the blessed man in Psalm 1 who not only meditates on the law, not only delights the law, but he, Matthew 5, 17, fulfills the law. He fulfills the law, which means to fill it up, actually, to fill it up overflowing. 
He's perfect. He fulfills the law. What does that mean to us? Well, if I have entered the new covenant by faith, which is only something God does, right? No one comes to Christ unless the Father draws him in, John 6, 44. The Holy Spirit convicts them of sin, righteousness, and judgment, John 16, 8. And then Jesus gives them salvation. He opens their eyes. That's why Jesus in the gospel is walking around opening the eyes of the blind, opening the ears of the deaf, raising people from the dead. He's showing that king, that's me. That, that, that blind people, that deaf people, I'm the one who can open their eyes because I'm the perfect one. I'm the begotten son. I'm the anointed king. I'm the fulfiller of the law. So what does that mean for us with the law? What does that mean? Are we under the law? Is the law in effect? The law is still in effect, but we're not under the law anymore. Romans 7, verse 5, For while you were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we could serve in a new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code of the law. We now walk in the Spirit. We're not under the law anymore. In fact, listen to what he says in Romans 8. Then we'll talk about who the law is for. Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus for the law of the Spirit of life. That's the law we're under. We're under the law of Christ, the Spirit of life. The law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus, that's the key, from the law of sin and death. That's the old law. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order, listen to this now, this is important, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. How in the world could the righteous requirement of the law be fulfilled in me, be fulfilled in you. Paul called the law ministry of death, and it was, because no one could keep it. In Galatians 3.24 he says, the law was a schoolmaster to drive us to Christ. But Christ comes, so we're not under the schoolmaster, we're under Christ, we're under the law of Christ, we're under the law of the Spirit. But how could it be fulfilled in us? Simple. Colossians 1.27 Because Christ is in us, the hope of glory. The law is fulfilled in us because the fulfiller of the law lives in us. Did you know that if you're in Christ, God looks down and sees you as perfect, as righteous, as holy and blameless, as a law keeper? It's true. Not because of anything you've done, because of the one who's in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You're in Christ, which Paul drives at in Ephesians 1, and Christ is in you, which Paul drives at in Colossians 1. It's all about being in Christ and having Christ in you. So what of the law? He didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. In fact, the law is still active, just not for you, if you're in Christ. Who's the law for? 1 Timothy 1, 8. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not, is not laid down for the just, and we are the just, we have been justified by Christ, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and the sinners, the unholy and the profane. He goes on and on and on. Who's the law for? The law is for the sinner. The law is for those who are not in Christ Jesus. But for those who are in Christ, you died to the law, you're now in Christ. So, does that mean we can just live any old way we want? No, of course not. If you're in Christ, you don't want to live any old way you want because that hard heart that Israel had, 
That's not for the believer. The believer has a soft heart. The king came. His name is Jesus. He fulfilled the law perfectly. He lives in you and he changes you. And by the way, he wouldn't live in you if he wouldn't live in you unless you were clean. Here's what he does. This is the new covenant also in Ezekiel 25, 26, and 27. I will, the operative words, I will, the two words, I will, I will sprinkle water on you. That's salvation. And you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove your heart of stone from your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. What Israel didn't have, we now have in Christ. And this is the best part. Verse 27. This is what it means to not be under the law, but to be in the Spirit. This is the key. Verse 27. And I will, God says, I will put my Holy Spirit within you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I will put my Spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my ways. It isn't a regulation and a rule system, a heavy yoke around the neck. Paul calls the law a uh, ministry of death, and it was. We're under the law of Christ. He does the work. He's the covenant. He gives the new heart. He lives in us and causes us to walk in his ways. So, what do you do with that when it comes to the law? What do you do with that in when it comes to Old Testament things, what do you do with that when it comes to the Sabbath? Is the Sabbath something I keep? How do I keep the Sabbath? Every time I do a video or I teach on this, there's always a lot of pushback because people don't understand those things we just went over. They don't understand the nuances of the New Covenant. The New Covenant is Christ. He lives in you. He causes you. To walk in his ways. So what do I do with the Sabbath? How, how is it that one would keep the Sabbath? If someone thinks that they need to keep the Sabbath, what is it that they keep? How do you keep the Sabbath? The Sabbath used to be sundown Friday till sundown Saturday. So am I supposed to go back under the law? Am I supposed to do that? I, that must mean I can't mow my lawn, I can't drive my car, I can't get a haircut, I can't go grocery shopping, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. Is that what we just read in the New Covenant? No, it's not. I will put a new heart in you. I will cause you to walk in my ways. If the Son has set you free, you're free. If you've died to the law, you're under the law of Christ. It's a new covenant. So, if I strive to keep the old covenant, if I go back and say, I have to keep the Sabbath like they did, that would mean I'm going back under the law. By the way, what happens if I, if I say I'm a covenant keeper or I'm a Sabbath keeper and I don't keep the Sabbath? What did they do? in the Old Covenant to people who broke the Sabbath. Look in Numbers 15, the guy's gathering sticks for a fire and he's stoned to death. Would that be for us today? Now everyone would all agree, no, 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 that's, that's old. That wouldn't be for me because Jesus came and Jesus did something so I don't have to suffer that punishment exactly. This is where the New Covenant comes in with things like tithing, with things like love, with things like Sabbath, even you think dietary laws, all of that. Let's look at that. Let's look at Old Covenant and New Covenant real quick. Old Covenant, you can't work on Sunday. What's that pointing to? What is that pointing to? You can't work on Sunday. I think it's pointing to something really really big. I think it's pointing to you can't work for your salvation. The Sabbath was one day a week. You have to keep it. What do we do now? If I'm in Christ, 
where is the Sabbath for me? How do I keep the Sabbath today? I think the answer is found in Hebrews. If you go to Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, it's all about entering God's rest. Entering God's rest. Israel did not enter God's rest. God's rest is salvation. Most of Israel didn't enter it because they had, as it says here, they had evil, unbelieving hearts that led them to fall away from the living God. But he says, but exhort one another, you, you exhort one another as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. He goes on and says, in chapter 4 he says, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you seem to have failed to reach it. For the good news came to us just as it came to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. Now listen to this. As he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, talking about rebellious Israel, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has spoken somewhere of a seventh day in this way. Listen to this carefully. He has spoken of a seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. That's true. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. He's going somewhere with this. Verse 6, Hebrews 4. Since therefore it remains for some to enter the rest, for some, those of faith, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter it, it most of Israel, because of disobedience, again, he appoints a certain day. This is where it gets bigger. This is where it gets better. There was one day, which was a type and a shadow, pointing to this. This is the Sabbath. Again, he appoints a certain day. When's that day? Today. Today. Saying through David so long afterwards, in the words already quoted, he says this repeatedly in these couple of chapters, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. What's, what is the Sabbath rest? Read the entire chapter 3 and 4. The Sabbath rest is today. When is today? Well, if I was to see you yesterday, I would have said to you, how are you today? And if you were to run into your friend tomorrow, you'd say to them, what's up today? It's today today. It's always today. Today is the day of salvation Today is the day of God's rest, God's Sabbath rest. The Sabbath is every day. This is what Jesus does in the New Covenant. Jesus comes and he takes the old types and shadows and he explodes them. It used to be the Sabbath was one day, now it's every day. Now, do we take one day and set it aside for the Lord? We don't have to, but we want to because we have we have changed hearts. Do we get together with believers and worship with them? Yes, Hebrews 10 tells us, don't stop doing that. That's the sign of someone who's been changed. They want to get together. By the way, Acts 20 verse 7, it shows us that it's no longer Saturday, it's Sunday. Is that a rule? No. They did it on the Lord's Day when the Lord was resurrected. That's when the first century church worshipped. They changed from the Sabbath to the Lord's Day. We can do it any day we want. We should enter that rest every single day. The Sabbath was a small picture pointing to every day. Same thing with tithing. Tithing. Should we teach tithing? No. Tithing was Old Covenant. Leviticus 27, Deuteronomy 12, Malachi 3.10. Everyone knows that one. Bring to the storehouse your tithes and offering. Right? That was 10%. Your first tenth. What does the New Covenant say? Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Let each of you give as he purposes in his heart. Not begrudgingly, for God loves a cheerful giver. What's that mean? My heart's been changed. My heart wants to worship with believers. I get to do it every day. 
my heart wants to give. If 10% was the training wheels, the law was the schoolmaster to drive us to Christ, the law was a tutor. If 10% was the training wheels, the training wheels are kicked off. I now give according to my heart. It doesn't mean I don't give. I give more. Everything's bigger. Everything's better. Everything's wider. Everything's higher. Everything's deeper. Everything's more intense in the new covenant. Remember Jesus, he said, you have heard it said that you shall not murder. I say, if you even think of your brother in a cross manner, if you say, Raka, you've committed murder. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I say, if you even think of that in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart. Everything with Christ is bigger. It's better. It's more intense. The punishment is worse. The blessings are better. When's the Sabbath? Every day. How much do you give according to your heart? That's going to be more than 10%, probably, because your heart's so grateful for having salvation. What about love? In, in uh, the Old Testament, in Leviticus, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. What does Jesus say in John 13, 34, 35? This is interesting. He says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. And you stop and you say, Jesus... That doesn't sound like a new commandment. He's not done yet. A new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. Oh, all of a sudden you stop and you say, whoa, he died for me. As I have loved you, so you will love one another. By this kind of love, all will know you are my disciples if you have love one for another. What's the big idea? The big idea is all those rules and regulations, they're fulfilled in Christ. The Sabbath, the tithing, love, everything was small. It gets bigger in the New Covenant. Has the Sabbath been done away with? No, it's been increased. It's every day. So, what do you do with all of this? Uh, I think what you do with all of this is you make sure... If you're in a disagreement with someone, you make sure it's not a salvation thing. If someone thinks keeping the Sabbath on a certain day has anything to do with their salvation, if someone thinks they have to eat certain foods and it has something to do with their salvation, that's another gospel. you got to tell them the truth. What if they're in Christ? What if they're in Christ and they think, nope, I have to keep the Sabbath. Nope. I can't eat this, I can't eat that. You know, Paul addresses that. I think we'll end on, on what Paul says in Romans 14. Here's what Paul says. Listen to these words carefully. As for the one who is weak in the faith, the ones who think they're still under dietary Sabbath laws, as for one who is weak in the faith, welcome him, do not quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who despises the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. He goes on, one person esteems one day as better than another, while, every, while another person esteems all days alike. Each one of you should be fully convinced in his own mind. Let the one who observes the day observe it in honor of the Lord. Let the one who eats eat in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. You can eat anything as long as you're giving thanks to God. But what does he say? Don't fight over it. So, if someone thinks they have to keep the Sabbath on a certain day, let them. Don't fight over it. There's enough things that we have in common in Christ. There's this, this whole idea of breaking fellowship over these silly things, it's not worth it. If someone thinks they have to worship on a certain day, let them. If someone thinks they can't eat shellfish and you know you can eat shellfish, don't eat shellfish. Go have a cheeseburger. Enjoy fellowship. Don't break up fellowship over something like that because there's plenty of things that we have in common so is there freedom in Christ yeah there's freedom in Christ do I have to worship on this day or that day 
I want to worship on every day. Should I get together with the saints once a day, once a week? Yes, I should. I'm free in Christ. I'm in the covenant Jesus. Jesus is in me. I'm no longer under the law. The law is for the sinner, for the person who doesn't recognize the authority of Christ. Does that mean I live any way I want? No, because Christ is in me and he's causing me to walk in his ways. I love to obey. You love to obey. That's the end of the matter. The end of the matter is this. If you're in Christ, you're free to eat whatever you like. You're free to worship on whatever day you like. Just don't argue with other believers about it. If God hasn't opened them up to it, let it be. Enjoy them. We have enough things in common. We don't have to focus on one or two things that we don't have in common. Peace.